Hey everyone, Thomas and Brian here for another live Q&A. We're back after a short hiatus. Yes, we much needed. Much needed. Uh, I had uh, some vacation time and I took it and it was great. Uh, but I'm very happy to be back here uh, with you guys and of course with uh, everyone's favorite uh, video host and uh, aquatics enthusiast, Thomas, who's here uh, like he is bi-weekly to answer your aquatics questions uh, as, as well as he can. Yes. And we're excited. Um, but before we start, uh, for anyone who uh, hasn't joined us before, uh, we're going to give you some ground rules here, okay? Oh! Uh, generally, what we do is uh, we answer questions in sequence, first come, first serve. So if you have a question, get it in the chat now, and uh, we should be able to get to it because once once it gets busy, uh, it gets busy. So throw your questions in the chat. We will get to it uh, in sequence. Uh, Thomas is going to do his best to answer any questions you guys have, but... Uh, if it is very, very specific to your your fish, if there's a, a very, very specific problem, give as much context as you can in your question and he'll do his best, but we may have to uh, incidentally flip you to our uh, our support team at the, the head office who uh, will be able to help you uh, more in depth, but we'll do our best. Yeah, the, the thing with those kinds of questions, especially <clears throat> when we're talking about the health of our fish or whether or not a fish is sick, it usually requires a discourse where questions are being... Uh, asked and answered back and forth and this is like a one question situation so it's tough to to deduce it uh, accurately down to whatever it is and what the solution should be so that's when we throw it to our support team to kind of help you get through that although I will obviously try to field the question here and yeah so the, the more context you give the better um, with that said what else what else what else um, if you guys do have a, a pressing matter uh, we do have that super chat feature and any way you guys choose to support us is great so uh, feel free to use the super chat and you get bumped up to the front of the line uh, should you should you need to be uh, what else what else uh, we're not gonna I think from now on going forward we won't answer que uh, que the question of Hey, what fish should I get? Yes, uh, I, I my my answer to that. Uh, people always ask, like, what fish should I get for this size tank? Just go look at all the different fish that are out there and see what inspires you and ask the questions that need to be asked about those species. Go to your local fish store, look through the entire fish room at everything they have. Take an employee and you know, kind of figure out what fish would fit in your tank, because that's like half of the fun of the experience. Is yeah. like, just don't just take what I say and do that. Yeah. Because that's uninspired. Yeah. So we're we will if your if your question is hey what fish should I get we will bypass that only because uh, uh, there are um, other more I guess relevant questions. I'm happy to answer compatibility questions. Sure. Yeah. Like that, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Don't tell me you have an empty tank and you don't know what to put in it. Yeah. Because that makes <laughs> us sad. Yeah. Yeah. And if you guys wanna uh, let us know where you're watching from because that always kind of tickles us to see yeah. where everyone's actually watching from. So feel free, feel free to throw that in the chat as well. We'd love to see uh, where you guys are watching us. Uh, but with all that said, we'll get to the questions. Thank you guys so much for joining us. You ready to jump in? Let's do this. Okay. I have one. I'm gonna assume that's supposed to be better. Sure. Uh, four guppies, four cardinal tetras, and two ghost catfish. How much do I feed them? How much should they feed them? Okay, here's a really, really general answer to that question. Um, feed them everything that they can eat within about three minutes. So just keep putting small amounts of food into the tank for those various fish, um, especially if you're feeding them different types of foods. Just small amounts of it. Uh, over the course of three minutes and just keep feeding them if they keep eating. If they stop eating, then you stop feeding. And that's it. You want to, you know, get them nice and, and uh, well fed. I personally like to feed multiple times a day as opposed to just once. Uh, because most fish, not all fish, some fish, especially like ambush predators, usually eat one large meal and stop eating for a while and then do it again. But many fish just eat small amounts of food all day long. So if you can break it up into two or three feedings during the day of a minute to two minutes each, that's brilliant. But yeah, you just keep putting little bits of food in for that, whether it's three minutes once a day or one to two minutes a few times a day, and just uh, just keep feeding until they stop, and then or your time elapses, and then you just stop feeding. Cool. Uh, how important is a sump system to a reef aquarium? I'm thinking about a 100 liter tank for a pair of clownfish. <clears throat> it's, uh, I've got the unpopular answer, and that it is not that important. Um, so it, the question is, is it's a little funny because you're asking about a specific type of filtration versus how important is a filter, right? How important, important is a sump filter to a reef tank? Not. I mean, it's in the grand scheme of things, it is not that important as long as you have filtration on the tank of some sort. Um, 
the nice thing thing about having a sump is one you've got an overflow system that is constantly extracting water from the surface of the aquarium so you'll never have surface buildup on the tank which means you'll have really great light penetration uh, there's no oily films kind of uh, getting in the way of any of that light so you're going to get the most of your light to your corals uh, the other thing is having sump increases overall water volume of the system uh, when i do sumps on reef tanks I, I really try to shoot for at least one third of the volume of the tank in a sump form. Um, that's my minimum. I, I'll go as high as having the exact same tank as a sump. So if I have a 20 gallon tank, I'll put a 20 gallon sump on it because that's just how I roll. Uh, so you've got all that added water volume. You've got a place to add a skimmer that's going to be out of sight. There are hang on skimmers you can get too. So that doesn't mean you can't have a skimmer if you don't have a sump, but it's nice to have uh, the flexibility of having any, basically any skimmer you want and for it to be in the sump. So it's out of, out of sight. You don't have to look at it. Uh, your heater can go down there. All of the other components of your equipment can go down there. And it's just, it's a nicer way of doing things. Um, and there is that uh, benefit of also your aquarium is always at the full level because water is going to evaporate from the sump. So you're, you're not constantly having, uh, you know, salt creep going up and down on the glass. It's leaving calcite or calcium on the, on the glass there. But no, you don't need one. I have done a SPS and clam reef system on a 20 gallon tank using an Eheim 2215 canister. So it's more than possible to use something other than a sump. Sumps just have a lot of benefits. I definitely prefer sumps. <clears throat> Holy! Tim Bennett. What is with you guys? Thank you. We love you. Thank you Keep so much. Keep on tanking. For Keep on Jeez. tanking indeed. Yeah, thank you guys so much, Tim. That's a really generous, <laughs> really generous. And it, yeah, we, we appreciate that. You're um, awesome. Yeah, and, and every every time it just gives me the warm and fuzzy. So thank you so much, Tim Bennett. You're a superstar and we love you. And thank you for everything. Um, we really do appreciate that. Let's see where some of these people are uh, watching from here. We have so many more questions that we will get to from Wisconsin. Hello from, hello, Wisconsin! You <laughs> probably hate that. You're probably tired of that by now, but <clears throat> you can't help it. Uh, oh, Suffolk, Suffolk, England. Suffolk? Suffolk? Suffolk. Yeah. Hi, hi, I'm from Romania. Romania! Romania, hi. Welcome, Romania. India. Yeah, India. We, got a, we have a lot of people watch from India, actually. Yeah. A lot of our views come from India. I'm so, so, I'm so happy. Yeah. Uh, uh, Candace says, Thomas, that hair uh, growth is happening for sure. <laughs> it's, it's getting ridiculous. Lovely walks. They're nice. Uh, hello from Montreal, uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, Tasmania, Australia. Brilliant. <laughs> wow. Other side of the world. Yeah. Um, Hull, England, uh, Peak District of England, lots of hills and sheep. <laughs> I love hills and sheep. Yeah. It's basically where I live, except for it's mostly cows. Are you going to get sheep, sheep one day? I was thinking about it. You should. I, I would love that. And we can do a video. Um, <clears throat> hi from North Wales, UK, San Diego, Africa, uh, Zimbabwe. Wow. That's so <clears throat> cool. Yeah. Uh, Ray and Armin from Munich, Munich Germany. Germany. <whistles> Hello. New Jersey. From New Jersey. Yeah. Dallas, Texas. Dallas. Uh, let's see. We got more and more coming in. Sweden, Finland. Uh, Max New, New Mexico, Mexico Bangladesh. Bangladesh the South Pole uh, you was, can't be serious I want to see proof of that but that would be awesome uh, write my name on the poll Scotland Denmark Finland Denmark awesome well guys thank you it's great having you guys here thank you so much it's awesome that we are uh, all around the world right now it's awesome to be uh, <laughs> around with you guys the world around the world oh, copyright I hope not yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Whatever. Uh, so, guys, yeah, thanks again for joining us from wherever you're joining us from. It's awesome. Uh, don't forget to hit that like button. That would help us out big time. Let's make this a party. Uh, hit that like button and uh, let's get uh, let's get us uh, to even more places. Um, Sweet. How do you remove nitrates from a saltwater tank without doing a water change? <sighs> Thomas is dead. You killed him. Um, okay, so nutrient export for nitrates can be done in various ways. Uh, I think one of the more popular ways of trying to remove excess nutrients, period, is through uh, an algae or uh, either an algae scrubber or an algae reactor or a Cato reactor, if you will. Yep. Cato. Cato morpha. Cato morpha. Anyways, um, those are probably the more popular ways of trying to remove excess nitrate and phosphate and the rest of it. Uh, Water changes, honestly, though, just work so well. They're simple. They're easy. You don't want super low nitrate anyways. Coral still needs nitrate. Um, but if your nitrates are super high, I mean, it's faster to just do a water change to drop them than it is to 
you know, just wait for your, your algae to kick in and start doing its job. Although if you're looking for a more long-term solution because you put a lot of food in, like you've got anthias or something and you're feeding a bunch during the day or, or you have a huge fish population in the tank and you just want to make sure that your nitrates don't get super high, just I would just implement uh, like a uh, an arid reactor or uh, who else makes one? Reef Octopus, I think, has one coming out if it's not already out. Uh, there's there's tons out there. Uh, we, I think we actually carry one as well. I think we do. What should I search for? Look up algae reactor. Algae reactor. Yeah. Yeah, wave, wave reef. reef. So we also have the wave reef algae reactor. Uh, it's it's a definitely more of a budget reactor. So if you're not looking to blow, you know, like 800 bucks on a small reactor, it's definitely a, a good option. It's a f huge reactor. Um, but yeah, that's that's usually what I do. I turn to either a algae scrubber reactor or refugium with uh, just a ball of K2 in it and a half decent light. And I've linked that in the chat for anyone interested in checking out that uh, Wave Reef algae reactor. For uh, a budget reactor, it's not bad. Yeah, all right, cool. Well, check it out if you guys want to. It's there in the chat. Uh, next question. Uh, my betta suffered mechanical damage from an old filter. I replaced it months ago uh, to a more appropriate one, but his fins still haven't grown back. He's alone in a 10 gallon. How do I help his fins grow? Oh, uh, it takes time. It's not a quick <clears throat> process, but your main goal is to prevent secondary infection. So a lot of people use something like Betafix in the water um, in small amounts just to help prevent infection. As long as uh, you don't end up with fin rot or a bacterial infection on the fins, preventing them from regrowing. It'll just take time, and it can take a long time, but it will take time. Cool. Uh, next up, snail has put white dots all over my drift. Yup, line. it's a nerite snail. Those are eggs. Good luck with that. How do I? How do you nope. remove it? No. Okay. <laughs> Manually with the tip of a razor blade. Have fun. Oof, that sounds monotonous. It is crazy monotonous, and I hate them for that. They're great algae eaters, but man, those little calcium eggs. So you're kind of yeah. stuck with them. And you, you, I imagine you'll remove it and it's just... They're just going to lay it's more. It's a process you're going to have to so do constantly. So either get used to the aesthetic or uh, like, okay, so on filter components and plastic parts and stuff like that, you can just soak them in a little bit of uh, uh, like citric acid mixed in, in some water or uh, vinegar and water, just basically an, a weak acid solution and it'll dissolve the calcium carbonate shell of that egg and it'll just disappear. Uh, but when we're talking on things like driftwood, and you can't really soak driftwood in acid. It's not a good idea. So uh, the only thing I've ever been able to do to get them off reliably, because even a stiff bristle brush just does not do it, I just take a, a flat razor blade, take the tip of it, and just pop them off one by one. But when there's hundreds on there, you almost want to just change the wood. But yeah, good luck. Uh, is salt water easy? It is. Okay. Saltwater fish, keeping saltwater fish, we have a video series on this, which you should link. Okay. Um, but keeping saltwater fish is almost identical to keeping freshwater fish with one big difference. And that only real difference is you have to learn the skill of mixing synthetic sea salt into fresh water to make salt water to do your water changes and to set up the tank and so on and so forth. That one skill is the only real difference between freshwater and saltwater. When you're talking about uh, like a reef aquarium, I would say the difficulty of a reef aquarium is very similar in different ways, but very similar to the difficulty of a planted tank. As long as you understand what the plants need and want and provide that for them, they grow and they do well and your tank is in harmony and everything works really uh, really well and you get that lush green planted tank that you want, you've got fish in there. Saltwater is the same deal. You just have to understand what it is the corals need in terms of elements and provide that for them through dosing. and. Uh, you know, making sure that those elements are where they should be at all times through testing. It's no different. It's this exact same skills, realistically, just applied to uh, like different parameters. So when we're talking fish alone, it's the difference of mixing salt. When we're talking about uh, keeping corals, you just need to understand how much light they need, what elements they need in the water and provide that for them. And it's not nearly as difficult in concept as a lot of people make it out to be. The, the place in where it starts to get more difficult for people is there is a certain amount of uh, discipline, I would say, and, and uh, 
proactiveness required from you as a hobbyist to make sure that your parameters are stable for your corals because they really thrive on stability. Plants are a little bit less picky, um, but corals need a stable environment. And if you are the kind of person who you know might get lazy on a Friday night when you normally do your water changes and just go, I'll do it next week or I'll do it tomorrow and you just keep pushing it off. If you're that kind of person, a reef tank is gonna be a lot harder for you than a planet tank or you know something else. There, obviously you could still do a reef. I would probably lean towards doing like a soft coral reef. Soft corals are a lot more forgiving. Um, but th those are the challenges. Like to get into the reef hobby, it's gotta be something you wanna do on a hobby level. It's gotta be the thing you wanna do not just to have a pretty reef in the house, but uh, to be the thing that you do as your hobby. Like, and that's w when you're going to find the most success. I, th I think the people who have a harder time with it are the ones who didn't really quite realize that there is an amount of physical effort you have to put in to making sure that tank is good for your, your corals. And yeah. I'm linking that um, video Hope that part, made sense. I feel like one. I droned on a little bit, but well, me. it's kind of your thing, but that's all right. People love it. Um, all right, so I've linked that in the <laughs> chat, uh, so you guys can check out that. It's, it's a like four part series, the how it to is, set up yeah. a, a basic uh, saltwater aquarium, just to kind of help you understand everything he just droned on. It about. doesn't have a sump. If it like just right now, I'm telling you that series is like a really simple, easy clownfish aquarium setup. It's for those. It's, not it's for complex. people who want to make the, the jump but exactly. don't want to have to if it's don't want to spend a ton of money yeah. right this is this is like a starter system for keeping clownfish yeah. just to prove like this was on the heels of finding dory coming out we wanted to make sure that people had an alternative to buying you know uh, a gigantic system just to have a blue tang in it but it's it's for anybody who wants a saltwater tank to have saltwater fish not to turn it into a gigantic hobby for themselves. So right. it's a really good, really good alternative. Uh, next question uh, related. Do you have any tips for someone just starting in the saltwater aquarium? Slow and steady wins the race. I, I there is, There's so many things to be said about setting up a saltwater tank. And uh, we'll get into that very soon in a new series we're going to be doing. But take things slow. Don't be afraid to wait a little bit longer to put fish in. Make sure you cycle the tank first. Make sure you do a lot of research on the different components and make sure that you don't A, get anything you don't actually need. Don't waste money on things because it seems like a good idea. I would honestly try it like the, the simple way first. Like just as an example, a lot of people want to get into the tanks, like get a saltwater reef tank and be like, I'm going to get an apex system. I'm going to get a wicked crazy controller right off the get-go and then don't realize how difficult those things can actually be to get implemented. And then just because it's implemented doesn't mean your tank's going to do really well. It's just a tool. So don't get caught up right away in all the different tools you can get to make your tank um, easier or better. It's like, or, it's like toys where people like getting a cool, yeah, a really cool and new toy. And the worst part is like in the forums and stuff, the way people talk about these, uh, these different products and things you can buy for your tank, they make it sound like you get this, your tank's awesome. Yeah. But that's not how it works. Your effort is what's going to make the tank awesome. Your research is what's going to make the tank awesome. So you could get a filter roller mat to basically constantly change chemo or mechanical media for you all day long, instead of having socks that you have to clean every few days. But cleaning those socks and having that <laughs> roller is not going to change. Like it's not going to make or break the tank. Your effort going into it will. So, yeah, just do the research. Um, you know, get hands on with your tank and stay hands on with it, and and you'll you'll do fine. And I don't mean just tinker with it all day for no reason because that's also not good. But just make sure you do your testing and do everything else, and you'll you'll do fine. It's not it's not impossible, and it's really not crazy difficult. It's just hard, I think, really, it's just hard for people who have a hard time putting the amount of effort required into it. Like if it's a hobby for you, you are gonna do just fine. It's like any hobby, you gotta put the, the work in yeah. the time in and to be successful. Yeah, you can buy a you can buy a freaking three thousand dollar guitar. It's not gonna make you a better guitarist. You still have to learn how to play guitar. You still have to practice. If you put the effort in, you're but, gonna do well, even with a hundred dollar strap. You'll, you'll look sweet doing it though with a nice three thousand. <laughs> but you gotta put the time in. Yeah. So cool. Uh, Briner Hidalgo, thank you so much. Brian, he, thank you. Uh, he super chatted us. Uh, Briner? Briner. 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 My bad. Briner Hidalgo. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if we, we butchered your name, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, we, we really appreciate that. Thank you guys so much. He says, no question for me. I love the channel. Really helped me a lot when I started my first saltwater aquarium recently. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. That honestly, I'm, that makes me so happy to hear. Yeah. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that. Uh, thanks, Brenner. That's Brenner. why we do this. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, next up, can a tiger barb 
go with an angel. Woo. Um. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have like one tiger barb and one angel in a tank if that's what you're asking. But if you have uh, like a, a planet tank and you've got some adult angels in it and you want to put some tiger barbs in there, that should be fine. As long as um, you're not already overstocked or reaching your limit. Tiger barbs can be a little bit boisterous, but so can angels, so it's not a terrible pairing. Uh, I would just avoid having young angels with adult barbs, because barbs can be very aggressive for their size, and uh, young angels aren't typically too aggressive, but adult angels with um, adult barbs or even young barbs is usually not a problem. Usually not a problem. You're dealing with two semi-aggressive slash aggressive fish, so anytime you're mixing those, it can be a little... Yeah. I would just also avoid putting like a single small angel in with several barbs that you already have, or putting a single barb in with several uh, like larger angels you already have. You, I would probably try, like if you've got a pair of adult angels, I'd probably put in three to five uh, barbs and then that'll help it go along a little smoother. There won't be just one fish to, one new fish to target. Coolio, uh, if you haven't already hit that like button, please. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, hey guys, I'm moving my 29 gallon to a new stand. Any tips to make it easy? Yeah, drain the tank. Or bring a lot of friends and all yeah. lift it. Uh, <laughs> don't do that. Um, drain, <laughs> drain the tank at least two thirds of the way if there's like some water in the bottom so you don't have to move the fish into buckets, that's fine. Um, and then just slow and steady and have help. It's going to be heavy. No matter what, it's gonna be heavy. Gravel is heavy, decorations are usually heavy. Uh, a third of 29 gallons is still like eight gallons, eight and a half gallons of water. Heavier than you think. It'll be, that tank will be over a hundred pounds, even with a third of a drain. So just have some extra help there or drain it all the way, put the fish in buckets, uh, move the tank and then fill it back up and put the fish back in. But that's it. It would be a process, but you can do it right. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, what is the best filter for a 20 gallon? That is so subjective. What is um, Thomas going to say? Hmm. My, I think my personal favorite filter for 20 to 30 gallons is a Ehon Classic Series 2213 canister. I'm shocked. Yeah. No, it's true. I like, uh, I like the Classic Series canisters a lot. Um, so a 2213 is going to be great for that size. Uh, if you're keeping like fish that prefer low flow, it might be a little bit much, but it won't be, it's not a ton. Like Eheim doesn't have the highest flow ratings for their, their canisters as it is because they really kind of tailor the flow rating to passing water past the biological media at an efficient rate for the size tank that the canister is rated for. So, but yeah, I like using canisters even on 20 gallons because the, the amount of media inside of the tank or inside of the canister is so much greater than, uh, you know, a, your average hang on filter that's rated for the same size tank, right? So if you've got like a single cartridge from a penguin power filter, it's like a thin cartridge, the volume of that cartridge, it, it pales in comparison to the mass amount of media that's in that tube of a body on a canister filter. So you do less maintenance with a canister, you've got uh, more biological media on a canister so you can have a heavier bio load in the tank. Like there's so many benefits to it. Um, otherwise, if you want to go with a hang-on, I've always been a big fan of the uh, the AquaClear hang-ons. They're built well. They actually have a lot of media for their size. For a hang-on, they've got a good amount of media in them, so I like that. The only other uh, option, and I don't know if they make one small enough for a 20 off the top of my head, would be the Seachem um, hang-on filters. They have the Tidal filters, and they have a lot of cool features on them that make them a lot of... Uh, a lot of fun to use, but also just really useful. Like there's some surface extraction on them. I think they're self priming as well. So that would be my other option. I just don't know if they make one small enough to put on a 20 without blowing things around. Cool, I've, uh, I've linked uh, for anyone interested, uh, our, our man, just in case, uh, said I was waiting for Thomas to say Eheim. We all were. We knew it was coming. What? Why uh, I do that? Yeah. So I, I linked uh, to the Eheim canister filter on, on uh, BigLSPets.com on our website. Uh, so you can check it out, learn more about it there. Uh, we've got a couple good videos on how to, uh, we've got the product review, but also like the how to set up and all that. So if you decide to go that route, we got you covered. I'd be rich if Eheim paid me like money every time I said Eheim. Yeah, I'd have so much money. <laughs> yeah, but they are—they're on sale uh, right now. Just saying, if you do want to pick one up, they're on sale. So yeah. check that out if you want to. 
Um, next up, uh, how many ghost catfish should I put together in a 25 gallon? Ghost cats. Like glass cats? They go by different names. I don't know. Um, if we're talking those, those glass cats that are like basically see-through and they have two big whiskers sticking out the front and Super otherwise cool kind of fish. look a little bit like an eel. But it's a really cool fish. I remember seeing some of it. Yeah. yeah, I loved it. It was really So neat. those glass cats, I like keeping them in groups of anywhere from six to 12. They like to school, so I, I don't like keeping them alone. The other thing with glass cats is they're usually relatively shy. So they like having cover, whether that's in the form of like a really spindly driftwood or uh, a lot of plants. Like they do the best I find in planted tanks or tanks with a lot of like spidery uh, driftwood so that they can kind of stay huddled at all times. You'll see them come out a lot when you feed. They'll kind of come out of the shadows and eat. But if you've got bright lights, they definitely tend to hide. Uh, should I keep koi in tank or a pond? I'm not sure this is, is this serious. I'm gonna. Do I'm people... just gonna re reply with my own question. <laughs> Do you prefer to have a you know 300 gallon aquarium to 500 gallon aquarium in your house? or the equivalent or larger of a pond in your backyard. That's that's for you to decide. You're talking about a fish that's gonna get like the better part of three to four feet long, weigh a, a butt ton, and also just poop like, <laughs> oh, like a machine. So if you want that in a tank, then okay, it's a big tank, there's a lot of filtration. <laughs> I'm not saying it's impossible. People have them. I've seen people with indoor ponds that have a glass panel, sure. which I think is a lot more practical than an aquarium for koi. Um, I think koi, honestly, are really just a pond fish, in my opinion. But you can put them in tanks. You just need a monster tank. I usually, if I see them in tanks, it's usually at a restaurant. The tank's like eight to 12 feet long. Yeah. So take good care of them. It's up to you. I think it's probably less expensive to put them in a pond than it is to build a tank that's appropriate for them. I'll, I'll say that. And they also, koi are one of those fish that look remarkable from the top. They just look really good from the top. Their pattern goes over their back. They're a very wide fish. You lose the ability to see them from the top when you stick them in a tank. All right, I'm done. Uh, this one's going to be tough. No, 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 I'm done. I'm oh. just kidding. Keep going. This one's going to be a, a bit tough. <laughs> Nothing we can really do okay. apart from a, a fish Heimlich maneuver, but even that's probably not good. Please help my Oscar fish. Uh, he ate a big plastic thing that came out of the filter. I'm not sure what, but if something came out of the filter. It was plastic. He thought it was food and he ate it. And now he can't eat anything and he's it says he's heavy breathing, which is not cool. Can you see it in, in his mouth and or throat? Because if you can see it, you could get him out of the tank and get it out with a pair of tweezers or tongs or whatever. If you can't see it and it's inside him, you either have to wait for it to pass, which it might not, and you might lose your Oscar, which is a super sad, mm. or you're gonna have to take him to a vet. I I have no other solution, unfortunately. Yeah, there's not much we can really offer there. Yeah, like I, if, if you can't get it out and it can't get it out, then it's gotta be surgery. And it's not, What's gonna come Not out of a, what plastic is gonna come out of a filter? Like, I don't know. I'm assuming maybe it was like a, either a chunk of sponge foam or maybe uh, uh, it had plastic bio balls oh, in it okay, or something. Gotcha, and you right. just... Yikes. Yeah. Yikes. Uh, well, good luck and yeah, hopefully like he was posted. we you know, I'm interested to see what happens. Hopefully you don't lose your fish. But, yeah, that's uh, that sucks. Yeah. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, why is my red racer nerite snail Roman shell white? and looks rubbed off at the top, and what can I do for it? He seems healthy and nips around the uh, tank. Okay, so snails get pitted shells because their shells are calcium carbonate, and they need to, Nerit snails naturally come from areas where there is a relatively high GH and KH. Uh, and because of that, there's a relatively high pH. It's at least neutral or higher. If you have a planted system, which people often put nerite snails in, and you use CO2, for instance, and you have a low pH, let's say below seven, it is not uncommon for snails to have a hard time calcifying their shells. And as a result, uh, they'll get like little bumps and nips in their shell that eventually start pitting out further and further because it's actually dissolving in the acidic water. Uh, I've never seen that actually like kill a snail but I've seen snails with shells that look basically like Swiss cheese uh, because it's been pitted out so much. Um, so if you can't raise the pH in the tank or in ensure that there's enough calcium carbonate in there, then there's not a ton you can do. 
Uh, one thing I used to do in the past for snails, and I don't know how well it'll work in uh, an aquatic setup, is because I used to keep different types of land snails as well, is I would get a cuttlefish bone and just let them eat that. And they will straight up just eat it. They'll just go on it and eat it. And that's how they get a lot of their calcium. So you could try uh, having something like that for them to get calcium from if you can't uh, raise the pH, but I would be worried that that's just gonna also dissolve slowly over time in the tank and raise the carbonate hardness of the tank and then in turn end up raising the pH. And if that's not something you wanna do, yeah, it can be tough. But I would wager that's what it is. And if you haven't tested your pH uh, or GH and KH to find out where it's at, test it and see if that is what the cause is because that's generally what the cause is. Good luck, let us know. Uh, I'm planning to buy a parrotfish how many gallons do I need? Freshwater parrotfish? Just one? Many? Uh, it says buy a parrotfish, so I'm gonna assume one. Um, okay, so I'm gonna assume you're talking about a freshwater parrot, and we're probably talking about the hybridized fish that is known as a parrotfish. It's a parrot cichlid, let's say. And um, I would often, at adult size, I would often say that they were I don't know, man. The reason I don't know is because <laughs> popular opinions change, but my opinion should just stay the same. Um, I think you, you'll, doing some reading, you'll see that you can keep them in as a little as 30 gallons, but I would argue that an adult parrot would, would be cramped in a 30 gallon tank. And I'm gonna say somewhere around 50 to 60 gallons for a single parrot fish is probably more appropriate. But if I'm being perfectly honest, if I were to do it, I would put it in a 90 gallon tank. There you go. I just like, I like giving them as much space as possible. Any fish that's large and has a lot of waste, I'd rather give it more water volume and have, just give it more space to do its thing sure. and have less uh, trouble keeping parameters in check. So the more water volume you have and the larger filters, et cetera, the easier it is to keep that fish's environment pristine and therefore the fish itself healthy so i just hate cramping larger fish in smaller systems yeah hello thomas please tell me how to maintain tds of planted tank please maintain the tds what okay so uh, tds stands for total dissolved solids for anybody else I, out there because I, I was like i don't know what that is but i'm gonna pretend i know what that is so <laughs> i have no idea the, the problem with uh, asking how to maintain tds is like asking how to maintain food like what what food in the fridge what exactly what temperature i don't know what you're talking about what do you want to maintain exactly because tds is literally everything that's in water that is not water so it could be calcium it could be nitrate it could be phosphate it could be uh magnesium copper it's everything so it's hard to really say now i i will mention that um fluval at one point had a filter with a built-in TDS meter or a conductivity monitor. And the whole idea behind it was that as the tank gets dirtier from the waste from the fish and everything else, the TDS in the water goes up, which is not untrue. But the problem is with, with that particular, was the G3 and G6 canisters. It doesn't account for the fact that in very hard water tanks like cichlid aquariums, your TDS is extremely high all the time. Saltwater tanks, salt, that'll take your conductivity monitor and max it out. So it'll just read like it's destroyed the whole time. It's just like, yup, your TDS is 1 billion, deal with it. So um, it's hard to answer that question because it's not direct enough. Do you, do you wanna know how to maintain the GH and KH in your planet tank to, to lower uh, you know, the heavy metals and stuff or, or the, the hardness in general? Are you talking about having nitrate and phosphate that's too high? You don't really know. In planet tanks, I would have to assume you're probably talking about just waste in general and water changes is an easy way to do that. If your TDS of your tap water is very high, then you have to use something like an RODI, uh, a reverse osmosis to take your tap water and get it back to zero and then use a product like Replenish to restore just a small amount of the necessary things like calcium, magnesium, etc., back to the water before you use it for your planet tank, if that's what you mean by TDS. We'll have to assume. If you specify, if you're still here and you specify, I'll, I'll hit it up when we get back to it. Yeah, they haven't said anything yet, but hopefully they will. Uh, I can't keep hair algae off my Monte Carlo. Any suggestions? Hmm. Why do you have hair algae? What's out of whack? 
is your lighting too strong? Do you not have injected CO2? Uh, do you not fertilize? Do you have no cleanup crew? Because if everything is in balance, you have enough light, uh, a steady amount of CO2, um, and uh, fertilization for the plant, the plant should be out competing the algae. So something's got to be off at least a little bit. Is it a brand new planet tank? Do you have very few plants for the tank currently? What I will say is that with hair algae or blackbeard algae, um, in the past I use Seachem Flourish Excel and I do a double dose of what they recommend on the bottle for the aquarium volume. And that seems to uh, basically destroy the algae. It, it will take blackbeard algae for instance and it goes from um, you know, that blackish blue gray color to the next day it's bright orange and then it goes clear and then melts away. So yeah. Also, manual removal can work well. It's hard on plants like Monte Carlo, but if it's that really stringy stuff, uh, we actually released a video not long ago of me doing maintenance on the low-tech planet tank. I purposefully let it get disgusting and it was very hard on me to do, but I did. Just yes, so I could show you guys did. how it to kind of, gross. it was disgusting. Just to kind of show everybody how you can take a tank that a lot of people would be like, oh, my tank's a write-off and just kind of reverse it with a little bit of maintenance. So uh, Brian will link that for you. You can have a look at that too. If it's the stringy stuff, you can just use a brush and kind of just swizzle over top of it. It'll take it all away. Link in yeah. right now in the chat so you guys can check that out if you haven't already. It's a nice, fun little bit. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, yes. how much more maintenance would you say a saltwater tank requires compared with a freshwater tank? If we're talking fish only, not much because the only real difference we're really discussing is that you have to add salt to the water um, when you're doing your water changes and when you set up the tank. If we're talking a freshwater, standard freshwater community tank versus a saltwater reef tank, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot of extra skills that you have to learn and a lot of diligence and um, just dedication in terms of making sure you're testing all the time, uh, making sure you're dosing um, appropriately because you've got to keep this, the environment very stable for saltwater uh, corals to, to thrive and do well. So it's, it's a big leap if we're talking freshwater community to go to reef. If we're talking like a full-blown crazy planet tank, it's very comparable to have a reef aquarium. It's very similar skill set. You're still testing, you're still dosing, you're still making sure parameters are stable. It's a little bit different, but it's essentially uh, the same skill set. Just there's a little bit more, I would say, involved in saltwater that you're monitoring on a regular basis, but very similar. I like them both. Cool. I love this next question. Okay. I have a 10 gallon in it. I have one beta, six rasboras, and two autosynclus. I am from Finland? <laughs> I don't know. Are you? I, I assume so. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, I, now I see you're still in the chat, uh, Sophia. I see you're still active in the chat. Uh, I can't see an, an actual question uh, here in the chat right now. We haven't come across it. But if you do ask it now in the chat, I'll make sure Thomas gets I it. So that. that was pretty good. I am from Finland. <laughs> I am I am Ron Burgundy. Uh, I have <laughs> I have a 64 gallon rimless. I nice. Have, I have a two 2.4. Oh, I have two 40 gallon filters, an LED light and heat, and U UVB for my male red-eared slider about four inches now. I have three guppies too. Do I need to upgrade anything before I add more livestock? Do you think? I hope you're not adding any more turtles. Is that what it was? Red-eared slider? Red -eared yeah. Slider, yeah. Um, and just be aware that your red-eared slider at any point could just decide to eat whatever livestock is in there because they do that sometimes. Um, sometimes they also just befriend whatever fish are there and don't eat specific fish and then eat everything else. Uh, I will say this. Red-eared sliders can be very, very, very messy. A 64-gallon rimless is pushing too small for an adult red-eared slider because they can get the size of a dinner plate. So you can imagine in a 64 gallon, especially depending on the dimensions, that's not a ton of space. Um, usually I recommend a minimum of 120 gallon tank for an adult red-eared slider. So you will have to upgrade eventually. Um, and they are messy, 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 messy. So two 40 gallon aquarium filters for a turtle is nothing um, by comparison to the absolute monstrosity of a dookie that they can lay on a regular basis. So I would say sincerely look at, at upgrading um, to a larger canister filter rated for 
at least a 120 gallon tank, if not more, and then also look at getting a larger tank before you think about getting more livestock. Real talk, I'm sorry. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Uh, so Sophia uh, said that she wants to know, is that too small of a tank? So it's a 10 gallon, one Beta, six Rasboras, and two Auto Sync lists. Uh, that, it's a 10 do, gallon too small. That's okay, just don't add anything else. That should be fine the way it is. As long as the rasboras aren't gonna get large, there are different types of rasboras, some are very small. Um, that should be fine, just don't go any more fish than that. You can maintain that. I would even, if you don't have any yet, I would uh, recommend just getting some live plants to kind of help uh, with water quality and oxygenation. Uh, I would do just like Anubias and or um, something super simple like uh, jungle, jungle valves that's they're gonna get way too big for a 10 gallon tank you'll be trimming them all the time uh or uh java moss java fern those things are very 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 easy to keep and they will pull nutrients out of the water quick and add oxygen so yeah cool uh but you're, you're maxed out Is yeah the, don't right? add anything else and you're you'll be fine all right uh will guppies breed when you have other species i'm not sure if they mean with other species or... do, you, do you mean they get self-conscious when other fish like are them. around yeah Barbara, I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> They're watching us. Yeah, the, the angels are right there. This is inappropriate. Just do it, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> we need to procreate. Um, as long as there's a male and a female guppy, they, they go and do what they go and do. Uh, I have not personally seen them interbreed with other live bears. I don't know that it is impossible. I haven't seen it in person. So, But if you've got two guppies of the opposite sex... You're gonna have baby guppies. Nature will do its thing. It, a lot. That's what they're known for. Them and the, rabbits. The, the, yeah, I was gonna say the they're like bun bunnies of the aquatic yeah. world. Exactly. They're in competition. They're like, yeah, we can we can outdo the bunnies. <laughs> Are dwarf gouramis the same as guppies and mollies and breed a lot? No. They're harder to breed. I've never done it. I've never tried. But. They're not like live bears. They're 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 a little bit harder. So you won't end up with like a dwarf garami infestation. Not in the same way you'll end up with a live bear of any kind infestation. Uh, we get this one a lot, so we'll keep it quick. But what do you recommend as a, a companion for a betta? Uh, snails. They don't need companions. People, okay, here's the thing. If you want to add more to the tank to like create more of an, uh, a cohesive environment because you, for yourself, Betas do not need friends. They almost categorically prefer not to have friends. Uh, this is because they're an extremely territorial fish that, uh, and luckily they have relatively small territories compared to other fish, but they're very territorial. So it causes them more stress than anything else when there are other fish in with them because they want to just vigorously defend their small slice of life. They are like the introvert of the fish world. <laughs> they just want to be alone and have their space. The only time they appreciate having a companion is when they're ready to breed and it's for a very short period of time and it's uh, they need to be separated afterwards because they can get very aggressive all over again. So I think it's better that betas for the most part are by themselves. I, I feel like they live better lives that way. They seem to be uh, less stressed, uh, act more naturally. They don't flare up as much. Although some people like to argue that um, having that, you know, interaction once in a while, you know, keeps them uh, from being, I don't know, complacent or like wasting away in boredom. Like they have to get aggressive over their space every once in a while, but you can do that with a mirror. Uh, so I, I personally like to keep things that are going to stay out of the way and not bother them. So things like um, if you've got like a, a beta in like a 20 gallon, you could put like a bristle nose pleco in with it. That pleco is going to stay out of the way. The beta is not really going to care. It's not going to make it feel like its territory is being invaded. Uh, snails are a really good option. Betas don't really care about the snails. They, they're not on the beta's radar. But other fish, especially other fish remotely flamboyant in any way, shape or form, like garamis or angels or... Guppies are a terrible idea because they have flashy fins and betas are like, oh, <laughs> this is my territory. And then they beat the snot out of them. So, yeah. Adding a companion Long answer. Is, adding a companion is more for yes, you than it you. is for the fish. Exactly. In terms of betas, they're not a schooling fish. They don't find comfort in numbers, not in, in the way other fish do. They, the they are solitary, yeah. Cool. Uh, what, are some, what are some fish, aside from cardinals, guppy, bettas, and tetras, 
What are some fish that are compatible with an African dwarf frog looking to find that statement fish? <sighs> Watching from Arizona. How about this for a statement fish? I don't know if it'll... The thing is, I don't know what will or will not try to go after it. An African dwarf frog. I like African butterfly fish. If you haven't seen them, look them up. I don't know if they'll go after uh, the dwarf frog, but they're one of those fish that, like, first off, dwarf frogs, I usually keep them in tanks that don't have water that goes all the way to the top because they constantly bop uh, up and down to the surface and watching them do it is fun. Um, and African butterfly fish look really cool from the top. They're a surface water fish. They'll be at the opposite side of the, the aquarium than the dwarf frogs are. And they're just really neat to watch. They're very, very cool. They're kind of like a cool little ambush predator and they eat off the surface. But look up African butterfly. They are really cool. How do you swap out substrate in an established tank? My current tank is lightly planted with 14 cardinals, one auto, and three ghost shrimp. My current substrate is tetra complete substrate, substrate capped with sand. So how do you swap out that substrate? Oh, I hate these things. Um, if I'm ever gonna do a substrate swap like that, I remove 99.9% .9 of the water, everything I can get out and put the fish in buckets, give them aeration or filtration if my hang on filter or whatever I've got fits on the buckets themselves. Gut everything out of the tank, <laughs> throw out whatever you wanna throw out and rinse the new substrate in uh, dechlorinated tap water and put that substrate in, slowly refill, add everything back. Don't clean your filters or anything like that during this process because you're gonna lose a lot of beneficial bacteria by swapping the substrate out. And uh, go really easy on feeding for the uh, subsequent week, subsequent, whatever, for the next week. Subsequent. Yeah, yeah, subsequent week. You got it. And um, <clears throat> just hope that you know, uh, you don't kind of disrupt the cycle of the aquarium by doing that. The, the hope is that your filtration, and I purposefully always go big on filtration for many reasons, but this is a great example as, as why. Um, the more biological filtration you have in your filters, the less likely you are to have like a, a cycle or your, your beneficial bacteria collapse in the aquarium from uh, having everything swapped out because there is bacteria on literally every surface in the tank that is helping with everything. Most of it should be in the filter. You should be using a biological media that has a insane surface area to encourage the bacteria to grow there and to stay there, which means doing anything in the tank shouldn't have a huge uh, impact. But substrate is one of those things that carries a lot of beneficial bacteria and there's a lot of stuff in there. So it's very, very important to go easy on the feeding and, and any kind of bio load right after doing that big switch over. All right, um, let's see, where were we? I think our man, uh, Justin Case, wants to know, are we coming to Aquashella? I was not invited, so I'm not going. I am going to Macna. I'll be there. Should we see if we can go to Aquashella? How much are tickets to that? Weekend VIP, 80 bucks. Kids, 10 and under, getting free. Is it Chicago? Is it Chicago, Chicago Illinois? Chicago, yeah. Here's the thing. Hmm. If you can get Aquashella to ask us to go and, <laughs> and and make it so that we don't have to pay to go, we'll go to Aquashella. We've got one month. Make some noise. Yeah. Maybe, if, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, the, the fact of the matter is we don't have a massive budget for this kind of stuff, yeah. so we just haven't been able to. Now, I, I was lucky enough that... Um, I'm, I'm going to be going to Macna. I was offered just myself, unfortunately. Brian's not going to be able to come. Um, I was offered uh, I'm not cool enough. By, by a friend to go with them, and they're taking me to Macna. I've never been to any of these uh, trade shows or, or anything like that. So I will be there, um, not at a table or anything. I'll just be walking around. So if you're going to Macna, feel free to say hi if you see me. Um, I would go to Aquashella, like Brian and I would be happy to go to Aquashella and shoot like a little video and say hi to everybody if Aquashella was willing to put us up for it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they care that much. Like I said, kids get... Well, I know the guys were over at Joey's not long ago um, that are, I don't know if they, they put on Aquashella or if they just also go to it, but there's another YouTuber, um, Coral, fi Coral Fish, I don't know, 12 Gallon? Fish Coral 12 gallon. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what his name is exactly. He's a great, great YouTuber. Has a lot of cool stuff going on. I know they're going. I'm, I know Joey's going. So let's see if Aquashella will put us up.
That would be cool. Uh, if not, like I said, kids get in. You know how like when two kids will go on each other's shoulders and wear a trench coat and sneak in? Is there like the opposite of that where like two adult guys can like... Oh, we'll put our legs through our pants bent Yes, and then okay. sew cool the shoes, shoes on the bottom. You got to shave though. No. We gotta, oh, okay. how do I'll just wear a bandana. <laughs> I'm that mysterious. Oh, I'll pull a Kenny and I'll just like cinch my hood right <laughs> yeah. up till it's like this. As long as we look under 10, we're in there for free. Then we, we get in the door and then just like pop out of our clothes. <laughs> yeah. Psych! And then run away. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, maybe. I mean, that would be super cool. I wouldn't mind going. Yeah, I would love it. JFO. Keep up the good work. Two bucks. Thanks, man. Thank you, JFO. You're awesome. Yeah, we appreciate that. Very cool. That's sweet. Uh, next up, what's the best fish for my grandmother? Uh, she has... Uh, that can't be true. She has no arms, legs, or soul. Also, also she's, she's dead. dead. So something super low maintenance would be great. I would go with a rock bass. <laughs> so you can just get a rock and draw a smiley face on it, okay? And then maybe, like, draw a fin at the back or something and just rest that near your grandmother. And there is no way that thing's going to die. Love it, though. Love it. People are weird. Good one. <laughs> uh, okay, I think he actually has a question, an actual question somewhere too later. Uh, okay, I have a five and a half gallon tank with uh, chili rasboras. Nice. Uh, do they give off a big bio load, and how can I put in a tank? How can I put them in a tank this small? Chili rasboras do not give off a massive bio load. They do, however, do well in groups. Uh, I don't remember what the adult size of a chili rasbora is, and I think they're one of the small ones. Give me un momento. In the meantime. Chili rasbora. Hello from Maui, Hawaii. What? Yeah. Newfoundland. Borneo. That's right. Just uh, not far from us. Uh, let's see. Who was that? That was uh, Jessica Flynn from Newfoundland. Which I always say Newfoundland. I just for some reason always say Newfoundland. I would be so much happier putting any fish in a 10 gallon and a five and a half. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they're basically just under an inch. I mean, I, w I wouldn't want to put more than three inch long fish in a five and a half gallon, if I'm being honest, but I wouldn't want to keep these guys in a number less than six. And most schooling fish, neon tetras, all that stuff, I prefer 12. Like 12 or more is kind of like a happy number for me. Here's what I'm gonna say. If you have a five and a half gallon, a 10 gallon tank is not an expensive upgrade and you can just take your filtration and everything from that five and a half, stick it on a 10 gallon glass tank instead. And I would do that and then get a group of six to eight. That's what I would do. Right. If you want fish for a five and a half gallon, I would consider looking at, oh, probably the easiest fish for that size tank would be a uh, endler. Endlers are lots of fun. Um, hi from Wisconsin. Hello from Nova Scotia. Uh, I've learned so much since I've started tanking. I went from decorative plants to live. My substrate is at least one inch. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> My substrate is at least one inch. My valves I purchased are dying. Oh. Uh, uh, what am I doing wrong? It's pretty open-ended. But Did you get corkscrew valves or jungle valves? Because if you got corkscrew valves, they are notorious for melting back. Um, I've never had success with them personally. I tried them once. They melted back in a tank that everything else, every other plant I had in there was doing great. Uh, if you want a really easy plant, I would do jungle, jungle valves over those. Uh, jungle valves can get very, very long, massive, but they trim back very easily and they just keep growing. So they don't care about getting trimmed down short. Uh, the other uh, suggestions I would have is for plants, just to start off with easy plants that don't mind not having CO2 and, and uh, a whole other gambit of things. Um, look at uh, Anubias, very, very easy, hardy plant, low light. They, they do well in almost any aquarium. They, may not, they don't grow fast, but they don't die fast either. So uh, I would look at Java Moss and Java Fern. Uh, and those plants are, are just hard to to screw up they just do well in almost every situation so start with those as long as you have like a fluorescent light on there at minimum or even like a low wattage led is fine they'll do okay and uh again if you used corkscrew valves don't feel bad a lot of people have trouble with corkscrew valves that's pretty normal they're a tougher plant to work with uh hi can we use both ceramic and K1 media in a single water bottle for filtering 
system for a if you system. convert the water bottle into some sort of like attachment for a power head so that it acts as a filter or you're throwing a uh, air stone down to the bottom of it or like if you mod it to actually be a filter so there's water flow through it yeah you can you can do that as long as it's uh going into a relatively small tank for the you know the size i don't know what size water bottle you're talking about exactly or anything like that but Yes, you can DIY a bottle into being a acceptable piece of filtration. And if you use trusted biological media, it's gonna do a relatively good job as long as you have adequate water flow. All righty, uh, here's a good one that you can speak to. Can you use well water for an aquarium? Yes, but you have to keep in mind that whatever the properties are of your well water, you either have to put that well water through a, a rigorous um, filtration system. I have one at my house that I've had to upgrade in various ways to make the water suitable for what I want to do with it. Um, or through an RODI unit, which I also have to do to make it suitable for saltwater aquariums. Um, you may have to do that to get your well water in a place that is good for the kind of aquarium you want to set up. Your other alternative, a lot of people have well water that has extremely hard water. So, you know, really, really high GH and KH. And as a result, you usually have a high pH. Just get African cichlids. Like you could just tailor the aquarium to the water instead of trying to fight whatever your well water is. Um, so for instance, my well water has uh, relatively high iron and tannins because my well is in essentially a forest and there's leaves and stuff all around the base of it all the time. So my well water is a little on the yellow side. So I'm setting up the mega build uh, discus aquarium to be a black water tank because it's a lot easier for me to do that than to constantly throw hundreds of gallons of RO into that system. So yeah, just some food for thought on well water. Yes, you can do it. Just do a little research with your well water and figure out what you want to do. Cool. Uh, are there any algae eaters that are compatible with African cichlids? I have a rubber nose pleco, but I don't want them to eat it. Uh, I would probably look at snails for Africans, like in terms of algae eaters. Uh, a lot of Africans actually enjoy algae too. So you can look at what species are going to do the most grazing. Um, there's a little bit of trouble there because some of the grazing species need to just only eat plants. If you start feeding them uh, animal protein, they tend to uh, not do so hot on it. Trophius are one of those Africans that you should just should avoid that kind of stuff with for the most part. But um, snails are a good option. The, the hard water for snails is not a bad thing. It's, we actually we talked about this earlier in the in the stream. It's good for their shells to be in a, in a environment that has high calcium carbonate and uh, GH, KH, um, and a higher pH because then their shells have the best chance at staying hard and growing and all that fun stuff. So, yeah. Uh, speaking of snails, and this is obviously you can't answer exactly what happened, but maybe some hypotheticals here. Uh, my snail baby is ripped. What happened? The body is ripped. What happened? Attacked by a fish, maybe? If there's other fish in the system? What? Um, <laughs> what kind of snail? Uh, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll say something. This is funny. Um, I don't know what snail we're talking about here. Some snail species, uh, and the one I'm gonna talk about in particular that this question comes up a lot with, in salt water is called a um, stomatella snail. And they're a snail that has a shell on its back, that is very, very shallow and small. It almost looks more like a slug with a shield on its head than it does like a true snail. But what they will do in a pinch is they will use a sphincter muscle in their body to essentially cut themselves in half so that their butt will wriggle around and attract whatever's attacking them so that they can escape and they'll just regrow their butt later. Super cool. So I don't know if that's the type of situation that your snail has going on or if it literally just got gashed open or what's happening. Yeah. I don't know. Need more context for these kinds of things. As much yeah, information as you can give would be um, helpful. Pictures will also really help. So if you want to reach out to our support team and send us a little photo of what's going on in a, a kind of description uh, with that photo, the, you guys can shoot back and forth and we'll figure out what's going on and how we can help fix it. Yeah. Uh, next up, which one is a good algae eater or maybe a better algae eater, uh, snail or shrimp? Um, they both have their own merits. I, I like shrimp a lot. I think they're a more delicate feeder than a snail in a lot of cases. I think they have a lot easier time getting on, around, and through plants and cleaning off plant leaves. So uh, I'm going to say shrimp have a distinct advantage there. 
where snails have the distinct advantage is they're a lot less likely to get eaten by fish so that they do a better job in, in aquariums where fish that would likely eat shrimp would be. Uh, they're a lot hardier than many shrimp. Like it's a, a lot harder to kill a snail than it is to kill a shrimp. Um, but they are not as good at, at cleaning algae on plants as shrimp would be. It's kind of like comparing a, a hammer to a screwdriver. They both do essentially the same thing, but well, they're better at yeah. their own individual thing. Yeah. Apt comparison. Uh, I'm thinking of getting my first tank, and I'm wondering how much sunlight is okay for a standard freshwater tank? As little as possible. Direct sunlight sucks on, on tanks because it will grow algae so quickly. It is the perfect spectrum of algae growing uh, light. So if you're doing a, a planet tank, like a high-tech planet tank or something, a little bit of sunlight during the day is not going to be the end of the world because your plants are going to be photosynthesizing very effectively anyways as long as everything's in balance. So the chances are you won't really get much algae. But if we're talking direct sunlight for like the morning or the afternoon, your tank will get algae like stink and you'll have wished you either put like blackout blinds on it or curtains or that you just put the tank somewhere else. So I highly recommend just making sure the tank doesn't get direct sunlight and then you just avoid the problem altogether. Alrighty, uh, but, but one of my bettas is biting his tail. How can I get him to stop? I've never heard of that, and I have no idea. Yeah, can you really even curb that kind of thing? If it's like, yeah, what do you I, do? I don't know. What is he bored? Um, try, try one day, giving him time with a mirror, maybe five minutes tops, and taking it away and seeing if he bites his tail at all that day. Like he, he I don't know if he's just like hit his little sexual maturity, and he's just like, I'm gonna fight anything. This is exactly what I mean by betas are are very aggressive and territorial. Apparently, this one sees its own butt and is like, I'm going to get it. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Alrighty. Maybe he'll just nip enough of his own tail off that he won't be able to see it anymore. And he'll just be like, like I oh, got okay. it. Yeah, that's good. I'm I got him. Yeah, yeah. He's gone. What is the ideal size tank for a blue tang? Ideal? Uh, I would, in my opinion, I think an ideal size for like a, either of the blue tangs really Atlantic or, or like a hippo tank, it doesn't matter. Uh, an eight foot tank, two to three feet wide, two feet tall, the volume of which is probably gonna be somewhere in the 300 gallon range. Right. They need a lot of space. We're talking about a fish that gets almost two feet, like full grown. They're big fish, man. Yeah. I mean, we see them in the hobby like this. And don't get me wrong, I put them in tanks of my own that were way too small for an adult tank. Uh, back in the day, my friends used to, um, I was really good at rearing young tangs. I don't know why, but I was really good at getting them to grow very quickly. And my buddies would give me these tiny tangs and I'd put them in my 20 gallon reef and I'd get them up to like from literally the size of a dime to like three or four inches within a few months or less. And then they would just go right into like a six or seven foot tank or eight foot tank or whatever my friends had at the time. But that's like, people see tanks and small tanks and they go, wah! But it's true, they need a lot of space to, to do truly well, to not get cramped and to have uh, the best chance possible at thriving. They need that space, they need it. So for an adult tang, if you plan on keeping it its whole life, which any fish you get, you should try to aim for keeping it for its whole life. Uh, you want space. And I think anywhere from seven, like the 265 would have been an okay tank. I don't think it's wide enough front to back personally. I really think you should aim for three feet where you can. I think, uh, you know, eight foot by three feet by two feet tall is my minimum if I was ever going to keep one long term. Alrighty. Well, I think it's about time. I guess it is. It is. Uh, we have run out of racetrack. Uh, it's been uh, an hour and 10 minutes and it went by like that. Super fast. I just snapped it half of the people out of existence. Did you see that? That was pretty cool. I don't feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway thank you guys so much for joining us uh, we really do appreciate it uh, for all you guys who come out and, and watch these streams and ask your questions uh, and watch all our vids it, it really helps us we love it yeah um, uh, so thank you guys so much uh, it is worth mentioning that we are at 96,000 and change subscribers oh, 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 we're so close we're that close to our 100,000 mark we're gonna get there uh, within 
the next hopefully a uh, month or so. Uh, hopefully sooner. If you guys uh, you know anyone who is in the hobby who doesn't know about us yet, let them know. And the sooner we get to 100,000 subscribers, the better because... We've got the 100K giveaway. And we're going to be giving away all kinds of crazy nonsense. All kinds of stuff. So uh, Pro Clear Aquatics is giving away an incredible 50, I think it's 52, 53 gallons, something like that. Cylindrical acrylic aquarium complete with stand, canopy, and sump filtration. That thing's worth That's... thousands and thousands of dollars. It's crazy. And we're cool. going to just give it away. Yeah, we're going to just give it away. Free. We've got uh, products from High Door. They gave, or uh, Akamai and High Door gave us an yep. amazing um, KPS and mm. a uh, K, or KP... KPS and LRS mm -hmm. LED light. These are awesome. I actually, I have them and I use them and I love them. They're awesome filtration. We've got stuff from Polyp Labs. We've got stuff from Mist King. We've got stuff from everybody. API pitched in. Like we've got so much stuff to give away. Yeah. And then we're giving away like uh, uh, Big Al's uh, like gift cards for, yep. for our, uh, our online store as well. Like uh, what, like a thousand dollars in, in oh, yeah. gift cards or something. Uh, just a ton of stuff that we're going to be giving away. Once we hit that 100,000 mark, we're going to launch that. You'll see it. Don't worry. Uh, it's going to be you're going to have like 30 different ways to enter and you get like for each thing you do, you get an, an entry. Uh, we have things that if you do it every day during the, the, the time period, you get another entry. So there's so many chances for you guys to uh, get yourselves into that, but we do have to hit hundred K first. So we're getting there, uh, uh, hopefully soon. So again, share us with anyone who might not know about us because the sooner we get there, the sooner you could win free stuff. And we have lots of prize packs. I think we're in the oh, yeah. around the 60 mark. I was aiming for a hundred. I don't think I'm going to get there, but we still have like 60, I think around 60 prizes to give away. Yeah, so uh, chances are good. So uh, definitely let people know uh, all about that. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Uh, check us out on BigLSPets.com, of course. Support us there uh, when you can. That would help us too. Uh, make some noise uh, in the direction of Aquashella and maybe see if they can... If they want us to go. Yeah, because we'd love to go yeah. and, and shoot some vids, and it could be lots of fun. Uh, we just don't have the means, unfortunately, right now to do it ourselves. So maybe Aquashella wants to make some noise in their general direction, uh, and maybe. Uh, what else, what else, what else? I think that's it for me. Yeah. How about you? I just want to tell you guys to keep on tanking, because that's what it's all about. I love to see how many people tank on with us <laughs> yeah. from all over the world. It's crazy. Very cool. Thank you guys so much for coming. We'll see you on the next one. Two weeks, two weeks. And you can see us come back and ask questions and show up on time and answer and put a question right away and we'll get to it. Yes. Okay. Bye.